our very first presenter, Marianne Challenger Kaiser. Uh, she is from UNO. Um, this presentation to this morning is crucial tips for writing professionally. Um, um, Marion owns WriteWorks Inc., which is a consulting company which offers services in writing, editing, and grant writing consultation, as well as workshops in oral and written communication, effective email communication, and enhancement of networking skills. She's an ad adjunct professor at the University of Omaha, I'm sorry, University of Nebraska at Omaha, and she teaches business writing components for the UNO Executive MBA program. She also previously taught business communication classes at the UNO at the graduate level, uh, and her professional experience includes corporate and foundation manager for the Omaha Performing Arts, executive director of the, Bluff, uh, of the Bluffs Arts Council, and assistant director of the National Conference for Community and Justice, Midlands Region. Uh, Kaiser is the author of Rule of Thumb, a guide to communication basics for small business owners and managers, and she's the co-author of Rule of Thumb, a guide to small business basics. Kaiser completed her undergraduate work in education in English at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and earned her Master of English degree from the University of Nebraska at Omaha. She also holds a certificate in nonprofit management from the University of Nebraska at Omaha and a certificate in arts administration and management from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. She serves on several volunteer boards and plays the violin in Orchestra Omaha, a volunteer community orchestra. Marian, thank you so much for joining us today. Take it away. Okay, um, here we go. All right. Uh, okay, here, okay. I think we're good. Okay, <laughs> we'll just go ahead here. Just a uh, couple of things that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, uh, because communication skills are just critical for every everything we do day in day out and so on uh just have a little food for thought i have some specific rules that <laughs> i really like to um uh impart to to people uh we're going to talk a little bit about some do, do's and don'ts for email the writing process the uh, creating clarity in your communication and then resumes and cover letters First of all, really, how important are these communication skills? Well, they're very important, okay? Recruiters from large companies always cite communication skills as one of the most important uh, skills for which they are looking. So, and keep in mind that good communication skills, whether they're written or verbal skills, they are learned. No one is born knowing how to do this really well. We learn them. So you can all learn them. I like to throw this in. This is from, <laughs> this is from the undergraduate book that we used that we taught out uh, 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 used for um, the undergrad. Um, this probably looks a little familiar about miscommunication and things that um, you know every, every piece of information goes through someone. It's kind of like that game we used to play in, in grade school, telephone, where you whisper in the first person's ear and by the time it gets to the last person, it's totally unrecognizable. But this- Hey, uh, Marion, your screen is not sharing yet if you're- It's not? No, go ahead and click your share screen and try again. Well, okay. Um, all right, wait a minute. Share screen. Uh, it's lit up. It's green. Oh, You'll my. want to click it. It's always green. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. There we go. Oh, it's okay. Okay. We can see it now. Yeah. Just go ahead and go into start. Play from. Play from start. Okay. I'm sorry about that. My apologies. There we you go. Have to love technology. <laughs> okay. I'm a little old school, so, you know, <laughs> technology sometimes. Mm, okay. Yeah, you have to remember, I'm old enough to have learned how to type on a typewriter. So. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the, um, we talked about learned skills. Okay, this one is uh, really, um, I really like that il illustration about miscommunication. 
this is my rule number one, and I tell everyone they should um, be able to recite, recite this one in their sleep. Your job as the writer is to make sure the reader understands the information clearly the first time he or she reads it. We've all had that experience where we're reading textbooks or something, whatever it is, and you have to read everything four times or six times or whatever to make sense of it. You know, just be nice to your readers and write it so that they can understand it the first time. Now, granted, are we going to do that 100% of the time? Probably not, but this is what we're striving for. My rule number two <laughs> part of communication is receiving the message. There's no communication if someone isn't getting the information. I mean, you can talk to a post all day long. There's no communication. So your job as a reader is to focus on whatever it is you're reading. The same goes for, for verbal communication. Focus on what you're hearing um, and try to understand it. So merely reading the words is totally different from understanding the words. So keep this in mind too. People will mistake poor communication skills for ignorance. They just do. It's how our puny human brains work. We can't help it. It's just how it goes. So <clears throat> you wanna make positive impressions with your communication skills. And so you need to be accurate and clear concise and notice that that's in bold uh, because being concise especially in writing uh, in this day and age where everything almost so much is done via email uh, you need to be concise uh, people don't want to read big long emails get to the point it does need to be grammatically correct. You don't need to use great, big, long words that nobody understands, but you do need to use them correctly. And sometimes it just comes down to remembering to use, say, you know, he is, not he are, <laughs> whatever. Uh, unnecessary jargon, oh boy, jargon, every, every, um, Every industry has its own jargon, you know, medical, there's medical jargon, legal jargon, there's railroad jargon. Uh, but make sure that if you use that sort of uh, language or those acronyms that the people that you're using them with actually understand them. And frankly, slang, avoid slang uh, in business communications. It's um, business communications are always courteous. And always, always, always respect, respectful of diversity. Avoid all those isms. One of the things you really need to keep in mind is that it's not about you. It's about whatever it is you're talking about. When we get to the resumes and cover letters, oh, no, 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 no. It's not about you. It's about your your education, your experience, your knowledge. It's about what it is that you have to bring to the company. Not what the company can do for you to advance your career. It's what do you bring to the company? And that's what it's about. It's not about you. So you avoid the I, we, me, my, us, our as much as possible. On the resume, never, never use the uh pronoun, uh, the I, we, me, us, our. Make the subject of your sentences whatever it is you're talking about. In your cover letters, yes, you can use, in your cover letters, you can use like my experience includes, but the emphasis is on experience. Remember that whatever, in the English language, Whatever you use as the subject of the sentence receives emphasis. So if you use I as the subject of your sentence, that's what you're emphasizing. You want to emphasize your experience, your education, your knowledge, 
and so on. So make those items the subjects of your sentences. Uh, in formal writing, it's always in third person. So if you're doing a formal report, it's always third person narrative. It's an it, uh, specifically a business. So please, a business is an it, not a we or a they. If you happen to say they, it's, you need to make sure that the reader knows who they are. Are you talking about management? Are you talking about upper management? Uh, if you're talking about more than one business, it's a they. But if you're talking about one business and referring to the business, it's an it. So keep that in mind. Good, good writing comes to the point. Uh, in business writing, you state the main point right at the beginning. If you have something longer, it kind of goes back to what you learned in high school speech class. You preview your main points. Here's my topic, and I'm gonna be talking about this, this, and this. And then you give the, um, in the, in the rest of the piece, then you give the details. But um, if you're giving instructions, uh, always use action verbs. It's like a recipe. Add this, stir that, bake, and so on. Use action verbs at the beginning when you're giving um, instructions or directions. Again, being concise, not using 25 words to say something you can say in 12. And um, I, I like to um, compare this to finding a, a needle in a haystack. Just give them the needle. The haystack is all those unnecessary words that do not need to be there. Just get rid of them. Um, just give them the needle. Just give them what they need to know. Uh, <clears throat> does any of uh, the percentage of meaning garnered from only the back and forth verbal con this, and this is in a back and forth verbal conversation, not not a lecture type of, of setting. <clears throat> but pe most people, uh, some people already know this, but most people are very very surprised to find that when we're talking uh, in a back and forth verbal conversation. On average, only 7% of the comprehension comes from the words themselves. 93% comes from those nonverbals like uh, facial expression, tone of voice, body language, and so on. That means when you're writing, you have to pack 100% of the meaning into what is normally only 7%. You don't have any of those <clears throat> nonverbal cues uh, for the reader to pick up on. It's all in the words. So we need to be careful. And one of the things you really need to avoid is trying to be funny or cute in writing because most of the time it comes off as sarcasm. And sarcasm can be pretty deadly. It's insulting and it's demeaning and uh, it's to be avoided at all times. So anyway, um, also uh, email, keeping in mind email is less formal, but it still requires grammatical correctness. Now, a lot of times in our, on our jobs are, um, just to get the job done, we're emailing back and forth uh, all the time with coworkers just to get the job done. Somebody sends you a real quick email, asks a quick question, you answer. Um, the question might be, uh, uh, what time is Jack arriving for our pre-meeting get together? And the answer comes back and says, you know, 10.15. Well, it's not even a complete sentence, but it's answered the question. So the level of formality is situational, as is most com communication. Uh, certain situations require more formality. Now, if you're sending an email that you know is going to be forwarded up to the CEO of the company, well, you want to be a little more careful. You want to make sure everything is correct and grammatically correct, spelt, spelling is correct, capitalization, punctuation, all that. Um, uh, 
usually, you know, email again is less formal. Um, so, but avoid being too casual because sometimes we get ourselves into trouble by being too casual and we end up saying something we did not intend to say. So before you hit that send button, always read it over, uh, read it out loud. You can even do it in a whisper if you're in an office with people, but read it and be careful. No text messaging abbreviations in business communication, even if you're texting. Problem is that it's, it's just considered unprofessional. A lot of people don't know what they mean. Uh, possible ambiguity, LOL can mean one more than one thing. You know, we've got laugh out loud, we've got lots of love, uh, there's little old lady. <laughs> Um, you know, and a lot of people don't know what they mean. I don't know what most of these mean. I picked them up off the internet and I'm like, hmm, what do those mean? Interesting. Somebody uses some of those with me. We, most of us know what TMI means. Um, I don't know what CMIW means. I, I don't know what it means. So just avoid them. Just avoid them. I put this up. Um, simply because I like the layout. When you are emailing, nobody wants to read big, long emails. I don't know if you've ever gotten those emails where they go on and on and on and on and on. And then they finally, at the very end, state the main point. No, state the main point at the beginning. Keep your emails rel as short as you can. Um, Use bullet points and numbered lists whenever possible because it does simply just make things easier to read. When we would much rather, I don't know anybody who would rather read a big long paragraph than read that uh, series of bullet points. It's much easier to read bullet points and we're more inclined to read them than big long paragraphs. So that's, you know, one of, one of my uh, uh, points is that if you have information that lends itself well to bullet points or numbered lists, uh, go ahead and use them because our eyes tend to go right to that bunched in area of bullet points and not the white space. So um, again, just uh, use, use whatever uh, little kind of tricks or um, methods of, of communicating that make it easier for the reader to um, to go ahead and read the information. Just some of these little tips that we probably, most of you probably already know. <laughs> I'm filling in the two line last because, eh, boy, how many times have we all sent an email before we were finished? Anyway, in the subject line, if any of you ever gotten a, one of those uh, emails where the entire message is in the subject line, that drives me crazy. You know, just, you don't need to use an or the. Most of the time you can get rid of articles. Um, and just be specific, mostly nouns. Uh, a subject line like question is probably not gonna mean much to the re reader, but uh, question, you can put a dash and then put whatever that question is about. Uh, and then it's a little more specific. Uh, again, state the purpose of the email right at the beginning. What applicable information do you have? Who, what, when, where, why, and how? The, uh, the good old the kind of journalism type of thing, but it's useful for any type of writing. Action requests. If you have an action request, my goodness, include it and include a deadline because if you don't, it gets put on the back burner because it doesn't seem to the reader that it's important. So, uh, and then one email, one email per topic. You have one, one thing to talk about, send two emails. Generally 25 lines or fewer. An email that's 85 lines long, nobody wants to read. So um, be careful about reply, reply all and so on. You know, if you need to reply just to the sender, be careful about hitting reply all. And again, always remember your level of formality. 
And so just a real quick recap, keep it short, short lines, short paragraphs, short messages for emails. Sometimes if you have long things, might be uh, wise to include it in, just make a, um, an, a document that you can attach. No text messaging abbreviations and proofread, 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 and this is for all communications. Some people, um, talk, I'm going to talk a little bit very quickly about the writing process. Um, a lot of people are very uh, intimidated by writing because they think basically about the finished product and they just start writing. Well, there's a process to it like there is everything else. It's like baking something or changing a tire. If you know the process, it makes it a lot easier. So there are basically three phases, pre-writing, research and draft, and revision and proofreading. So the first one is that pre-writing process is, okay, what information do I have to convey? Okay, that's, that's where you start. Who's your audience? What do they already know and what do they need to know? You don't need to waste time, your time or theirs, telling them stuff they already know. So um, if, if you have a project, if you're in the middle of a project and you're getting to your team members about uh, something, you don't need to tell them the pieces they already know. Give them the piece they need to know. And then what's the best method of communication? Do you need to have a meeting? Do you need to make up a, a summary report? Or do you need to just send an email? Or do you need to get together face-to-face? -face? How are you going to communicate it? Well, we're talking about written communication, so we're going to concentrate on that. You need to gather whatever information you need. Now, if you're doing a long research project, yeah, your research is going to take a lot longer. Sometimes you already have the information in your head, so that's all you need to do is just give them the information. Sometimes it takes you two minutes to look up maybe in the company files for an answer. Uh, so don't let research throw you because <laughs> it, just, it just means making sure you have the information that you need and that it's correct. Uh, identify any details that need to be included. If there are details, sometimes you just have a quick answer for somebody. You have to organize your information. If you, you anything that you're doing that's a little longer, and I know so many people, they think back to high school when they were forced to make these outlines. Well, by gosh, you know what? The outline is your friend because it's a tool no different than a hammer. You're not going to nail or hammer a nail with your fist. You use a hammer. You have a tool. The outline is a tool. It keeps you organized. It lets you very readily see what information you have or maybe what information you're missing. Maybe there's information that, you know, you look at your outline. It's like, oh, well, that doesn't even really need to be there. So you take it out before you waste your time writing a whole big piece on it. So, and then you write your rough draft and it's a rough draft. Keep that in mind. So your draft, again, state your main point at the beginning. You follow with your details, your brief summary at the end. Again, this is for writing that needs something uh, that needs to be summarized at the end. Sentences generally eight to 20 words because if you, we learn to read and comprehend in chunks and these chunks are called sentences. And when you try to put too much information into one sentence, the comprehension level goes way, way down because the reader gets lost in, okay, Where's the main point here in this sentence? So roughly eight to 20 words. It does not mean you're never going to have a sentence longer than 20 words. But boy, you start getting sentences that are 30, 35, 40 words. Look to see where you can break it up into two. Can you break it up into two? And most of the time, yeah, you can. So keep that in mind. Sometimes we have sentences that are shorter than eight words. And that's okay. That's okay. You just don't want all sentences shorter than eight words because then you start sounding like the little first grade Dick and Jane readers, you know, see spot, see spot, run, see Sally, chase spot, whatever. Um, 
but roughly eight to 20 words is a good comprehension level. So when you are um, uh, proofreading and revising, and remember, the proofreading and revision process is extremely important. Professional writers actually spend about 75% of their time on the revision and proofreading. So keep that in mind. It's, it's an extremely important piece. My, I prefer, I'm kind of old school, so I prefer printing out a hard copy because I can write on it. And if you're one that's very adept at doing it on online, that's fine with the little, the tracker, the editing tracker, that's fine. I've used that before too. My preference is to have a hard copy. Proofread out loud. And I highly recommend this. It slows your reading speed so that you notice mistakes more readily. It forces clear and correct pronunciation. Usually if you've written something, you're somewhere along the line, you're gonna to have to say all of those words. And if you don't know how to pronounce them correctly, you're gonna sound like you don't know what you're talking about. So if you're not sure about the pronunciation, go and ask somebody who actually does know how to pronounce it or pull out the dictionary and figure it out. You know? So make sure you know how to pronounce all the words. It does help identify garbled sentences um, with word processing. It's so easy to really mess things up. You're trying to fix something and you either you delete too much or you delete not enough and you have a sentence that actually doesn't make sense. And when you're trying to read it out loud, you're kind of tripping all over your, excuse me, all over your tongue. And so it really helps identify those. Uh, it also helps identify unnecessary or out of place information. When you read it out loud, it actually hits you. When uh, just scanning with your eyes, it doesn't. So um, email to yourself and to a friend. If you have a document, uh, and, and this is especially important for resumes, especially if you're going to be emailing a resume, because sometimes when you email something, the setup will get, because of software differences, the, the setup will be all different and it'll look all out of, out of line and so on. The alignment will be wrong and so on. I always recommend proofreading out loud multiple times for these various um, aspects because our brains, our puny little human brains, they're what we've got. And we can intentionally focus on only one thing at a time. So if you're trying to focus on all of these issues in your writing at the same time, you will miss something. So read through for content, read through for organization, then grammar and sentence structure and so on. I highly, highly recommend it. I know people say, oh gosh, that takes so much time. Well, in the end, you will have a better product. And then you make your, all your corrections, proofread out loud, have someone else proofread it, because we do not always see our own mistakes. We really don't. I can't tell you how many times I have proofread something that I have written over and over again. I proofread it out loud, blah, 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 you know, followed all my own instructions and somebody else reads it and they still find a mistake. <sighs> okay, all right, that's the way it is. So anyway, have someone else proofread it. Get a second pair of eyes on it. Again, points to remember, consistent format. You're writing something longer with uh, section headings, subsection headings and so on. Make sure your format is consistent. Appearance does count. Um, we know that our own appearance does count. We go to an, a job interview. Yeah, our appearance counts. Our, again, our puny little human brains cannot help it. We make and we get an instant impression of someone or something within three to five seconds. And we can't help it. It's just how our brains work. And that includes the appearance of our documents, our written documents. They make an impression. So make sure that the appearance is neat, tidy, well-organized. Uh, again, eight to 20 words. Get someone else to proofread out loud and you proofread one more time. Going, uh, talking about clarity. 
and being concise. You do not need to use great big long showy words. Use words that people understand, but use them correctly in the sentence. So uh, confusing expressions, again, slang and bug buzzwords, just don't use them. Big long sentences, no. Uh, the sample that I have here, subsequent to the passage of the subject legislation, it is incumbent upon you to advise your organization to comply with it. Oh, for heaven's sakes, that's ridiculous. Just after the law passes, tell your people to follow it. Be clear, be concise. Don't try to sound like, I don't know. I don't, you know, I, I, I always like to say, you know, the, the ha that English, teach professor syndrome, but someday somebody's going to say, my grandfather was a Harvard English professor, what's your point? But, <laughs> but you know, we, we, we kind of, you know, in our heads tend to associate Harvard English professors with, you know, people who use big long words and big convol long convoluted sentences and so on. Don't do that. Just be straightforward. Okay. If you're one of these people that has a hard time Okay, where do I start with this sentence? Well, everything is built on a foundation and sentences are built on a foundation. And that foundation, that foundation is the simple subject and the simple verb. So start with that. And you will start writing much more clear, coherent sentences. Fred organized, well, what? I mean, it's a sentence, doesn't tell us a lot, but Fred organized is a sentence. Okay, he organized the work schedule. Well, which one? Okay, next month's work set schedule. What about it? Well, because of a family emergency, you know, do you need to convey that information? No, well, maybe not, but if this is what you want to convey, here it is. He organized next month, uh, month's work schedule because of a team family member emergency. The, uh, the manager of operations, Fred, reorganize, and so on. Make sure that, and, and when you do it this way, you're much more likely to put your modifying words and phrases in places that they belong. Because remember, English is a word order language. We cannot put words out of order. Uh, if any of you have never took Latin or any a lot of other languages. I um, I do speak conversational Czech as my mother was born and raised there. Um, and you can put words in different parts of the sentences um, within reason uh, because of the word endings. The word endings will tell you whether it's a direct object, an indirect object, a subject. A predicate nomen, you know, um, so you can move things around a little bit. English, you cannot. Uh, if you say, uh, we have a sentence, uh, Fred presented the report. Only Fred presented the report means something different than Fred presented the only report. So keep that in mind. Word order is critical. So uh, a consistent verb tense, yeah. The only time we don't use consistent verb tense is uh, something like this. Something that happened yesterday or, you know, somebody's telling me something now about what happened yesterday. So, or yesterday, Jack told me he will leave tomorrow. By necessity, you have to change verb tense in, in a situation like that, but especially in a report. Yeah, generally, your tense is going to be either present tense or past tense most of the time past tense, and but, so be consistent. Conciseness, we always throw in so many words we don't need. Rising up, well, rising by definition is this direction, up. Audible to the ear, come on, things are not, <laughs> things are not audible to one's nose, uh, and so on and so forth. Gather together, mm, descending down. I'm for abolishing and doing away with redundancy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Anyway, conciseness through reduction, sometimes it's just simple little things like, instead of saying, because we wanted to be on time, it can just be to be on time. We don't need all those extra words. And it's much more easy to comprehend for the reader because we don't have to read through all those words 
to get the meaning. Uh, we can reduce things to single words. The meetings that have been canceled. Yikes, just the canceled meetings. Um, his career, which is in it? No, his in engineering career. Huh. Again, avoiding sentences that start with there, is, are, was, were, be, am, or been. Oh my goodness, it, they're just filler. So instead of saying, there are 15 people in this department. No, the department has 15 people. So watch out, watch out for the bin because bin has to come with a helping verb. And someone will say, there could possibly have been something. And they don't think that's the problem. No, it's still the same problem as there is. So avoid it without an antecedent. Remember antecedent? <laughs> junior high. Antecedent is that noun that the pronoun refers to. Um, it, sometimes we start a sentence with saying it is. It, what is it referring to? If it's this whole explanation from that previous sentence, you don't have an antecedent. You need to say specifically what it is. This situation, this problem, this result is. Okay, name it. Give it a name. Same thing with thing. Don't use thing without, I mean, we use something, but give thing a name. Thing is pretty vague, so give it a name. Using of or eliminating of whenever possible. The phrase is the phrase off of, mm, no, never, ever. It's just off. It's just off. And something can be based on something else. A movie may be based on a book. It is never based off of a book. It's a based on. Anyway, so avoid those wordy phrases in order to or enable in order to be able to, in order to be able to complete the project by Friday, no, to complete the project by Friday, that's all you need. Uh, and then there's this list of them due to the fact that, no, that's just be, because of, in spite of the fact that it simply means although, and so on. I am of the opinion that, <laughs> no, it just simply, I think, or I believe. All righty. I would appreciate it if, now just please, and so I'm generally use fewer words wherever possible. The reason why is because it drives me crazy because it's, uh, you're telling the person the same thing three times. Reason means you're telling a person the reason. Why also tells the person you're telling them a reason, and because also tells the person you're telling them a reason. No, the reason is that, and then just state what that reason is. Run-on sentences have absolutely nothing to do with length. It has to do with punctuation and conjunctions. When you're joining two complete sentences together, you have to have a comma and a conjunction, either um, you know, there's and, but, or, nor, for, and yet, depending on what your information is. Or conversely, you can eliminate the conjunction and use the semicolon, okay? You need either the comma and the conjunction or just the semicolon. So keep that in mind. Run-on sentences have absolutely nothing to do with length. If you have a long, long, long sentence that just goes on and on, it's just stringy and long. It's not necessarily run on. Watch out for sentence fragments. Uh, went to Houston for the conference. <laughs> okay, but keep in mind that for your resumes, you will be using sentence fragments. But in most writing, other than resumes, or maybe one of those answers to a, a quick short answer to an email. Um, somebody says, okay, where did you go for this? Or where are you going for this conference? They email you, you, you email back to Houston. Okay, fine, nothing wrong with that. But for most writing, you really need complete sentences. So 
sometimes we have a missing verb. Ellen, who is the head, who is heading the HR evaluation team, mm. is, okay, we need a comma and then rest of the sentence, it's just not there. A dependent or subordinate clause, this is a group of words, remember, again, we're going back to <laughs> junior high and high school grammar. That's that it has a subject and a verb, but it makes no sentence standing alone as a sentence because it has a word like because or although or whenever at the beginning of it. Although the project was fully planned on time, <sighs> comma, what? Okay, I need some more information. Uh, a phrase, a phrase, a phrase is just a, a group of words that do not have a subject and a verb that belong together. Having completed the project on schedule, what? Okay, so watch out for those. Watch out for those. They're, they're silly mistakes. And I think, you know, I'm sure you all recognize these as, as errors or as sentence fragments. But boy, when we're writing, especially if we're in a hurry, boy, it's easy to do this stuff. Pay attention to spelling and frequently confused words, loose versus lose, it's versus it's, there, there, and there. I, E, E, G, oh my goodness, affect and effect, yikes. Uh, your and your, lie and lay, then, then, between and among, between, it's two things. Between this one or that one, among is used for three or more. Among these three or four choices, I prefer this one, okay. Fewer, less, number, and amount. Fewer is used to refer to something that's plural. This, this team has fewer people on it than this other team, okay? This report, singular, provides less information than that other report, okay? Same with number and amount. Number used to refer to something plural. The number of projects to uh, finish by the end of the year. Okay, number of projects, plural. The amount of work, work singular, the amount of work for each project uh, is significant. Okay, so keep those in mind. So uh, when you go to the grocery store and the, um, the, uh, the checkout line says, um, uh, you know, uh, 15, 15 items or less, mm, it's supposed to be 15 items or fewer. So anyway, <laughs> okay. Anyway, spelling, spelling, spelling actually does count. And we, we all know that spell check will not pick it up. Meet, meet, here, here, where, where, right, 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 and right. Uh, course, course, two, two, and two, sight, sight, and sight, and compliment. Anyway, pay attention to those. So let's get to the resumes. A uh, lot of do's and don'ts. Here's a lot of do's. You do have to customize each resume for each particular job for which you are applying. Pay attention to those keywords because you want to include those in your resume. Keep in mind that many, so many anymore, the, the, especially the larger the company, the larger the business, the more likely it is that this resume is going to go through a scanner before a human ever looks at it. And the scanner is going to eliminate a lot of resumes and you don't want yours to be one of those. So you do want to include those keywords in your resumes. Uh, focus on your most relevant experience, okay? Use bullet points, no sentences in a resume. Uh, in your, um, your summary at the beginning, um, it may look like sentences, but usually it's not. They're actually incomplete sentences. This is where you can get away with using incomplete sentences. <laughs> um, anyway, so, and we'll have some examples of that. Use data whenever possible. Um, um, uh, uh, in, increase productivity by X percent or so on and so forth. You know, use actual quantitative numbers wherever you can. 
uh, your education and job history always go in reverse order. Your most recent ones come first. Uh, and don't forget to include that city and state. If you have relevant volunteer work, make sure you include that. And if it's really relevant to what it is you do, you can include it in your job experience. You just need to make sure that you label the, um, the position as a volunteer position. All right, so uh, volunteer uh, finance coordinator for whatever, okay? Uh, include those soft skills because, uh, like communication skills, they are important. They are important. Um, organizational skills, um, your interpersonal skills. Interpersonal skills are extremely important. So, and I've got that. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Apparently, I did not. <laughs> I, I forgot to delete one of those. So I've got soft skills twice. Okay. Uh, personal accomplishments, if relevant. If you have, or if you have volunteered for an organization and you have organized, at one point in my life, I, uh, I organized a state convention of a, um, uh, volunteer, uh, well, it was a volunteer philanthropic organization that had chapters all over the state. And I was the chap or chapter president the year that we were do we were hosting the state convention. <laughs> so guess who got to organize this thing for like 400 people? Uh, yeah, 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 maybe it was five. Anyway, um, yeah, I put that in my resume because it is relevant information. It shows managerial skills, organizational skills, and the the um, the uh, convention was successful. Yay! <laughs> um, so those are skills that are useful in a job. So yeah, make sure you include those. Um, use those action verbs at the beginning when you're listing your job responsibilities and accomplishments maximize, consolidated, administered, and so on. Uh, don't switch out a lot of fonts. Use a font that's really easy to read and make sure your job titles stand out. So oftentimes you put your job titles in bold because uh, they're easy, to, easy, easy for the reader to spot. And then again, consistent format. Make sure you include your contact information and hopefully one or two pages uh, depending, you know, if you're one of these people that's um, uh, sought by headhunters or um, uh, as, as my, my daughter is in the medical field and she's done a lot of research, if someone was looking to hire her, she would have several pages because she, she does have a lot of research behind her, but that's a whole different kind of situation. Some of these don'ts, do not use those personal pronouns in your resume. And don't be wordy. The fewer the words, the better, okay? Uh, don't be afraid to hide gaps in your unemployment, especially now if, if the reason a person is unemployed at this point in time, and certainly if it's because of, of the, the COVID situation, oh my goodness, there's nothing to hide about that one. Uh, don't use slang or texting abbreviations or cliches and so on. Do you really need the list that you know how to use Word? And again, avoid those big words. Uh, don't include uh, information that can be discriminatory. Be careful about that. And we're talking, you know, political affiliations, depending on what you're uh, applying for. Um, you know, religious affiliations sometimes, you know, and, and it's often this type of you know, uh, bias can be very unintentional on the part of the, the reader, but be careful about that because it can happen. Uh, again, no more than two fonts. Um, if you, each bullet point, a bullet point should not be more than two lines. So, and don't attach a photo. A photo. Uh, you really don't need to do that. Unrelated information like hobbies that have nothing to do with what you do. Um, no. And again, don't stretch the um, don't stretch the truth. 
most of the time anymore, you do want, instead of an objective at the beginning of a resume, uh, use a summary. Especially, usually though, I mean, if you're recently out of college, you may be more inclined to use that objective. And you can see the difference here. The resume summary actually summarizes what you have accomplished so that the prospective employer can see, oh, okay, wow, okay, here's what this person has done. This is a good indication of what this person can do for me or for my company or for this company. And note that the, um, there are quantitative, there is quantitative information in there. Received an average 85% customer satisfaction rating to date and so forth, so on. So include quantitative information wherever possible. And note that on the objective, uh, that it does include some experience, but it does focus on the goals. So again, that would be more uh, for someone who has recently uh, graduated from college and is looking for kind of to launch their career. So pay attention to those. Now, this resume, uh, yeah, what's wrong with this resume? Well, a lot of stuff. The summary is just hard worker known for keeping in, keeping it real. <laughs> oh my, keeping it real. I'm kind of so here we go, slang and then ha ha. <laughs> no, don't be cute on a resume. One of the pro, okay, they're looking to be, they want a job as a full-time writer. Well, you will notice if, if you look down the, the page, the writing experience is at the bottom. Ay, yeah, 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 yeah. That needs to be right at the top. All these jobs that are uh, waiting tables at restaurants and sushi bars and so on, they really are irrelevant. Maybe put in one because um, restaurant jobs, do, you know, uh, boy, they give you really good experience to hone your people skills. <laughs> so maybe putting in one, but do you really need all of those? You really don't need all of those. I would maybe put in the most recent one because waiting tables, again, as I said, gives you great, great opportunity to hone your people skills and your, your tactfulness and so on. Anyway, um, but yeah, uh, put in relevant information. Um, and again, your skills, a sense of humor. Oh, please, no, uh -uh. This, this is really horrible. You know, Kaisi said, find one that's really bad and show it as an example and get, boy, did I find a lot of bad ones, boy. <laughs> So, oh, lordy me. So there are a lot of bad ones out there. So pay attention. This is one that is actually a good example that I found. And I uh, pitch, you can find some good examples out online. I found this one on Resume Genius. Um, I don't know. The one thing I probably wouldn't do was put those um, skills in blue. But, you know, I guess it's okay. It's okay, but you know, look at the format, the resume summary, uh, detail oriented financial analysts. I, actually, you wouldn't need to capitalize financial analysts, but I'm old school. Anyway, with six plus years and so on. Again, notice that they actually aren't complete sentences. They're written out as if they were sentences, but they really aren't complete sentences. And notice that they don't use I or any personal pronoun. Okay, and then it does list your most relevant, relevant skills. And then your relevant, um, whoopsie, your relevant um, experience and so on, education. Again, look at how simple and um, very, very straightforward, easy to read, easy to read format. All the, um, all the contact information is at the top and, and it's labeled, okay? Most of the time, I, I don't know that you need to label it. Most people can recognize an email address. They can recognize a phone number and so on. Uh, not sure you need to put your address on it. 
um, but you do need your email and a phone number. So, and here is uh, you know, kind of a little kind of mini resume. So, um, and just as an example, another way, this is a very simple, straightforward resume. Again, your name, uh, contact information does have the address, resume summary. Again, your resume summary should not be overly long. If you start getting more than five, six lines, I'd see where I can start cutting something. Can I say something in fewer words? Is there something I could actually leave out? This one does have um, quantitative information. Uh, it says, you know, raising funds for a multi-million dollar project, including $18 million building project and so on. Uh, skills and core competencies, then the experience, education. Including community involvement, if you include that, and actually any more in this day and age when companies are trying to be more socially responsible, including relevant community involvement is a good idea because they can see that you are socially conscious, uh, con conscientious, and so on. Okay, so we always we have to have a cover letter. In most instances, we need a cover letter. A lot of times, even, even with the online applications for places like Indeed and whatever, uh, they do ask you to upload a cover letter or a letter of application, um, same thing. Two terms for the same, same uh, item. Some do's and don'ts, again, do's, uh, customize each one as you would the resume because each job, boy, you wanna, um, home in on those uh, keywords in the, in the job posting. Use standard letter format. Remember the inside address, the place to where the letter is going. Uh, include the name of the person. Um, and sometimes if you don't have it, sometimes if you pick up the phone and call HR and ask them, you know, say I'm applying for this position, do you have the name of a person to whom I should be addressing this letter? And they'll either tell you, or if they say, just address it to, um, you know, HR. Oh, okay, dear HR department, or dear HR, or dear selection committee, or whatever they tell you. Most of the time, I try to avoid to whom it may concern, because it sounds like a generic letter that's gone out to 25 different job applications, but, um, if they tell you to say, oh, just put to whom it may concern, fine, go ahead and do it. <laughs> um, expressing your interest in the company, uh, you know, you don't have to go on about it, but just some quick reference to it. Again, it's not about you. It's about your skills, your qualifications, your experience, your education, your knowledge, okay? Try to limit the use of I to three or four times in your letter and avoid starting the letter with I. When you go out online to look for, I was utterly <laughs> dismayed <laughs> over some of this. Uh, going out online and finding what, uh, and I did find some that were quite good, but I found many, many that were considered, they were posted as good examples of cover letters. And they started out with, I am writing to, well, first of all, you don't need to start with I, and secondly, you don't need to tell them you're writing because they can see you've written this letter. So when you say, I'm writing to apply for, mm, no, you can start the letter with, this letter is in application for, and then name, name the position for which you're applying. Problem with starting a letter with I is that, again, when you start a sentence with I, and making it the subject of the sentence, it gets emphasis. If you start the paragraph with I, it gets double emphasis because it's emphasized twice. If you start the whole letter with I, it's emphasized a third time. So 
I would avoid starting the letter with I, and I would certainly avoid telling them that you're writing because they can see you doing that or that have done, you've done it. So I, I do take exception to the letters as examples that say I am writing to apply for, anyway, that may be because I'm old school, but I think it's a valid point. So make sure you ask for the interview. This is the point where you do want to use I because you are telling them what you want. I would like to schedule an interview at your convenience. You give them your contact information. Yes, you give them the contact information in the letter when you're asking for the interview. Don't make them go back to the resume, look for it. Put it in there. Uh, and so remember, it's not about you. A few don'ts. Again, don't start it with I. Don't tell them you're writing the letter. Don't try to be cute and do not use humor. It's not appropriate in a cover letter for a job application. And don't use slang or jargon. Uh, don't use contractions or abbreviations. Spell out the words. It's more formal. Um, Contractions actually are very informal, so pay attention. If you're writing a formal report, avoid contractions. Uh, do not ever go over one page in a cover letter and do not forget to say thank you. Uh, say thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, and don't say thank you in advance because you don't know what they're going to do. So don't say that drives me nuts. Thank you in advance. You're assuming that they're going to do something. You're assuming they're going to give you the interview or whatever. And remember, the 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 uh, the, the resume is to get the interview. It's not to get the job. It's to get the interview. Um, but you can say thank you for your time and consideration because if they've gotten that far and read your letter, they've already given you their time and consideration. So that's very appropriate. Anyway, cover letters. Um, this one is really bad. <laughs> I read your as first of all. It starts your with I, I read your letter for the assistant position and like to apply. Mm. Yeah, you would like to? Well, are you going to or aren't you? Mm. As my resume shows you, I have a lot of great experience. Well, great in the sense of good, wonderful. Uh, it's borders on slang. So use good or wonderful. Uh, excellent. I have a lot is also slangy. I have a great deal of experience. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, my extensive experience includes, and that way avoiding the I. Now, yes, you can, in the letter, you can use my, my experience. But this emphasis is still on experience because experience then is the subject of the sentence. So be careful about that. Please review my resume and call me as soon as you can or as soon as possible. I'm so eager to meet you. Hope to see you soon. Oh, please, no. Uh, here's a bit of a template. Uh, for a, um, a cover letter. Here's another way to start uh, one without using I or I am writing. Mm. XYZ Corporation's listing for whatever position as posted on the company's website. Let them know where you found the information. Most of them want to know because they want to know where their uh, advertising dollars for the position are uh, put to the best use. So let them know. Uh, it immediately drew my attention because, okay, why am I applying for this job? My education qualifications matched the qualifications or the requirements for this position. And this might be where you might like to say what interests you about that company. And again, keep it short. As my resume indicates, and this is, this is a good thing to put in your resume uh, or, or in your letter, as because you're summarizing, you're not regurgitating everything that is on the resume. Summarize it, as my re resume indicates, so on and so forth. And then in, at the end, I would like to schedule an interview at your convenience. Please contact me at, okay? And putting both your, uh, if you put um, your phone number, actually, if you just prefer um, phone contact, just put the phone number. Uh, if you prefer email contact, put that. Um, 
or you can put both. Um, or if they have specified that they prefer that the, you know, the company prefers to contact you a certain way, then you use that method. Again, thank you for your time and consideration. I look forward to hearing from, and again, this is where you can use I, and it's fine. Just do not overuse the I. I, I did come across some uh, cover letters uh, online that, again, that were presented as good examples that about every other sentence started with I, and I almost fell off my chair. Um, I, I would avoid that overuse of I. Again, overuse, okay? Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is, again, this one starts with, this letter is in application for the position of development director at ABC organization and so on. Uh, you can use bullet points. Uh, a few accomplishments achieved in my years of experience are the following. Name the most important and relevant ones. Actually, the most impressive ones, <laughs> the ones you want. So again, use bullet points if it's appropriate, okay? So uh, just a few reminders. Remember my rules. Uh, writing lacks all those nonverbal cues, so you do have to pack 100% of the information into the words only. Okay, be aware of being too casual in emails. It's easy to do. The resume and the cover letter get you the interview, not the job. And it's not about you and proofread everything. <laughs> okay, so I'm ready for any questions that anyone may have, because we have a few minutes left. I know I've kind of raced through a lot of this information, but um, I think it's, it's all important information. And uh, actually, I left out a lot of stuff I would like to have included, but not, not enough time, so. Um, there was one comment in the chat. It's from Chris. It says, a job coach has told me to use a table format to compare job requirements to my skills and experience. What is your opinion, please? To use it in the resume? Um, to use a table format to compare job. The cover in, letter. In the cover letter? Oh, okay. Well, I would assume if you keep that really, really short and, and focus on only the most important ones, um, yeah, again, but you just have to be careful because you really don't want a cover letter going over one page. And if you're going to do that, you need to make sure that um, uh, you can get everything else you need in that cover letter all in uh, uh, one page. So that that is a, a, a one way to very easily summarize how well you do match the requirements for that position. So yeah, I would I would think that would be that would be fine. Any other questions? You can always unmute yourself as well if you want to ask. Um, I have a question. So with um, email correspondence, after you've sent the initial email and, you know, it says like, good afternoon, Marian, and you go into the, into the body of the email, once you're going back and forth, do you need to continue saying Marian, comma, and then continue, or can you leave that part out? I think, you know, uh, generally something like that, that is a little more informal. So and especially if it's an on the job type of situation. Yeah, you can, you know, and it's a whole thread. It, it's a whole conversation that creates a thread. Yeah, I, you can leave it out. I mean, that's my opinion. I think it's fine. Um, if, if it's concerning a job application, uh, I'd say after 
after you've used the person's name and the comma maybe twice or three times and then there's more back and forth, uh, I'd say it probably might be okay to leave it out. Um, it depends on how in, actually it would, in that kind of a situation, I would think it would depend on how informal the person at the company is being. If the person at the company continues to use the salutation, your name and the comma, I would continue to use it. If that person at the company drops it, I also would then be inclined to drop it. I would kind of follow the company's lead if it's a situation like that. Or if it's if it's a company, uh, some a company that your company is doing business with, uh, I would maybe follow that same rule. I would maybe follow if, if it's a client company, um, you certainly want to maintain professionalism. And if that company that is your client company continues to use that salutation, I would continue to use it in the thread. If they drop it, I'd say go ahead and drop it. Other questions? Okay, do we have any more questions? Christina, do you have anything? I don't. And her presentation and templates will be on that website that we posted the link to. Yeah, yeah there are so there are templates for the I also you should have uh, some um, resources that you can um, access one of the a, a really, really good resource for writing of all types, including research papers, APA uh, style, MLA style, uh, documentation, you know, how to document research and so on and so forth is uh, Purdue OWL. And I listed it first on the, um, on the list. And if you just Google Purdue OWL, it's through Purdue University. Uh, it is, is one of the most uh, well-known and highly respected uh, sources for writing. They have all sorts of 